This is Join Us in France, episode 71. Hello, I'm Annie, and on today's show, I take you to the Pantheon in Paris, which I visited myself for the first time just recently. There's been a lot of talk about the Pantheon recently in France because four new persons were buried, and I'm not sure if I should say buried or interred, but anyway, they were brought into the Pantheon the last week of May 2015, and it's not something that happens very often, and since I had just visited, I paid extra attention to it. There's a lot I could say about this because culturally it's a big deal and it's a bit of a controversial issue, but my main goal today will be to help you decide if you'd like to see it or not. It could really go either way. Some people would never think of skipping it, while others probably, you know, they're not sure and they might move it right off of their must-see list uh, after uh, having listened to this uh, description. So how, which way is it going to go for you? I don't know. Stay tuned and you'll find out. At the end of the show today, I'll be answering a very astute listener question that will be of interest to a lot of you, I think. I'd like to include more questions and answers on the show because if you are wondering about something, you're probably not the only one. So how do you ask a question? Well, you call the show's voicemail. You put on your Skype headset and you go to www.speakpipe.com forward slash join us in France and then you click record. You'll be limited to about a minute and a half but that's usually enough to you know to ask one question and if you don't remember the link I just gave you don't worry if you go to joinusinfrance.com there's a send voicemail tab on the right hand side and it works the same way and it's really really easy. And also, because many of you asked for this, I'm going to introduce a new feature at the end of the show, which I'll call the French Tip of the Week. Now, there's always a little bit of French here and there in the show, and I'll continue to do that, throw it in whenever I think about it. Uh, but I'll also teach you a few words or something quick that's going to be helpful to you on your trip. So you have that to look forward to at the end of the show as well. So where is the Pantheon? It's in the 5th arrondissement, so it's in the center of the Latin Quarter. It's on one of the hills of Paris called Montagne saint Geneviève, which is the name of the church that used to be there where the Pantheon is today. There are three other notable places right next to the Pantheon. I'll mention them briefly. The Lycée Henri IV, which is a high school, and it's France's most prestigious high school. It's to the back of the Pantheon. So where you enter, it's at the very, very back of that. In France, typically, you're assigned a public high school based on your address, but this one is a little bit different. About 40% of their students, for the high school, I mean, are locals, but the rest have, are people who have been noticed and they're outstanding and they've been kind of invited to come to this school uh, because of the superior level of education or whatever. It's a bit, no, it's a very much of an elitist kind of process. Most of the kids there are super rich and, you know, and they're already destined to be uh, the leaders of the nation. And it's just how it works in France. It's, it, I don't, you know, some of that is good and some of that is very bad, but that's not the subject of the, of the show today. Anyway, you cannot visit that high school anyway, but it's a huge deal in French culture. And as you walk around, you'll probably be rubbing shoulders with important people and their children. Uh, <laughs> number two uh, is the Eglise, so church, Saint-Étienne-du-Mont, which is, I think, one of the most gorgeous churches I have ever seen, ever, anywhere. You know, it's it's a flamboyant Gothic style. It's a must-see. It's not that big, uh, and I will probably do an episode just about that because I loved it that much. Um, but if you're in the area, you have to pop in at least and walk around quick. It's It's beautiful. And also the third thing is that when you're at the front of the Pantheon and you look down the street, it's called Rue Soufflot, you will see about 400 meters away, you see some nice greenery. Well, that's the Jardin du Luxembourg. And at, in a distance, about four kilometers away, you see the Eiffel Tower popping up. So it's a, it's a beautiful perspective and it would make for a lovely photo. I thought about it, but it was pouring down with rain. So I couldn't bear to get my camera out in the rain and that much rain. And so I, I didn't do it, but you have a nice perspective and the Rue Soufflot is, has pretty building. Anyway, it's 
for photographers, you should check it out. <laughs> you should like it, I think. All right, there's much more to see in the in right in that area because I mean it's the Latin Quarter, but I, I just wanted to mention a few. And even if you decide not to visit the Pantheon, you'll probably walk near it at some point. You could look at it uh, just from the outside. There are buildings called Pantheon all over the world. The most notable one, of course, is in Rome. Uh, is the first one. It was built in the first century, so it's much, much older than the Pantheon in Paris. And the one in Rome is a Catholic church. The one in Paris was built between 1764 and 1790, so it's much, much more recent. It was definitely inspired by the Pantheon in Rome. I mean, just, you know, it's the, the style of the Pantheon is, in Paris is called neoclassical, and of course the Pantheon in Rome is the classical. But, but that's where kind of the similitudes end, because the Pantheon in Paris is a burial place. It's a decidedly secular, yet cathedral-like building. It's kind of an interesting, you know, it, it looks like a cathedral, but it's secular, you know, so I'll, I'll go into more of that later. The word pantheon comes from the Greek and means something like to all the gods. So it's a building that honors the gods of French culture, such as Voltaire, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Victor Hugo, Émile Zola, Jean Jaurès, Jean Moulin, Pierre et Marie Curie, uh, André Malraux, Alexandre Dumas, etc., etc. Et There's so many. Entry is seven and a half euros for adults. It's free under 18. There are reduced prices for people under 25. Anyway, it will not break the bank. You know, when I think of the prices I paid in New York to get into anything, like <laughs> it's 40 bucks to do anything in New, in New York. Um, in Paris, you know, 750, it's eh, nothing. So to me, that's a good thing that you can, you know, it's affordable. You can go see it if you're interested. Okay, my first impression was that it is huge. Uh, it, it is 360 feet long, 275 feet wide, and 275 feet tall. Now, these are the exterior dimensions, but when a building is as tall as it is wide, you really, really feel it when you get inside. To me, it felt too big. It felt cold and impersonal. It's very stately and grand, but not at all warm and fuzzy. So um, that's, that was my first impression. I don't know if that will be your first impression, but that's what it did to me. It's, it's definitely a masterpiece of architecture. It was designed by an architect named Soufflo. And I already told you the, that name, the street in front of the Pantheon that takes you to the Jardin du Luxembourg. It's called Soufflo, S-O-U-F-F-L-O-T. And he he was a great architect. He, he he had big dreams, and he definitely did something extraordinary. But time did its uh, magic, and the Pantheon is in need of some tender love and care. the The issues came from you know all the tremendous pressure exerted on the arches, the fact that the roof was not totally waterproof anymore, and the rebar reinforcements were rusting in some places. So the 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 building, the whole Pantheon, is being restored one bit at a time. It started in 2013 and is not expected to be completed until 2022. Now, as I'm recording this, June 2015. And if you're listening to this in the future, hello, future. Uh, <laughs> uh, it should be the restoration of the the restoration of the dome should be finished very, very soon. And then they're going to move on to other parts. It is a huge undertaking restoring something like this. They 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 brought in a huge crane. They had to build scaffolding just for this which was a huge undertaking because, of course, they can't put any pressure on this already delicate uh, dome. And so the, the, just the stuff that they have to do to keep it, uh, to keep it safe and to uh, give access to the workers is unbelievable. It's just a massive uh, undertaking. They, they are moving, replacing stones. They are redoing work. They're scraping it clean. I mean, they're doing all sorts of things all at once. And they're going to move to different sections as time goes by. So uh, it's going to be absolutely glorious in 2022. 
But in the meantime, you're going to have to put up with some, some work being done, which is fine. I didn't find it, you know, my, of course they were doing the roof. So it was all happening over my head uh, on the outside. I, I didn't see any very much of that. So just earlier, I said that it looks like a cathedral, but it is a secular building. Well, what happened is this was built to be a cathedral, okay? It was uh, Louis the Fifteenth wanted, is the one who commissioned it. He wanted prestige and uh, he wanted Paris to be the most beautiful city ever. And this church was to be dedicated to Saint Genevieve. Saint Geneviève, the patron saint of Paris. But then the revolution happened, and the, the, when the revolution happened, the church, Saint Genevieve, was almost finished. With all the politics that went on, it's complicated for me to even follow all the things that happened, and it's not the point of the show anyway. But they, the revolutionaries decided to do something different with this building. They didn't want another church, and they actually destroyed a lot of churches. So obviously that wasn't their idea. They, that's not what they wanted to do. It was decided as soon as 1791 that the Pantheon would be the place where the nation celebrates its most famous and most outstanding men. And I say men on purpose because for the most part it's men there. And that's one of the problems with it. And I'll I'll, uh, I'll say something brief about it. To be a great person, you have to be a man. They didn't even see the things that women did because they were not trained to see the extraordinary things women were doing. And uh, it's a recent thing that we go, oh, why is it that there's only men? Like, huh... Eh, maybe some bias there. So so that's that's one of the problems with this place is that there are only two women in there. They, sorry, there are two more that just came in. But there were only two women on the day I visited, so uh, early May 2015. It was Marie Curie and another woman whose name escapes me, but she wasn't there because of anything she had done. She was just there because her husband was there and uh, they had... Uh, decided for some reason that she could be buried with her husband. So there you have it. <laughs> they just added two more women, and I'll talk about them briefly in a bit. But at any rate, with the revolution, it was decided that this pantheon was going to be a place of recognition for the great minds and the great people of France. Four new people were given the honor to be moved to the pantheon on May 27th, 2015. This is called Pantheonisation in French, which as far as I know, has no English translation thus far, not none that I could find. It just means taking a person and bringing them in to the pantheon and giving them the honors. So this time there are two men and two women, and I must admit that the fact that uh, it's 50-50 men and women is amazing at this point. Their, their names are Pierre Brossolette, Geneviève de Gaulle Antonioz, Germaine Tillion, Jean Z. I'm not going to try and say these in English because you wouldn't like the result. <laughs> and of course, the French president, François Hollande, gave a speech on the occasion. And I'll let you listen to a little bit of the conclusion of his speech in French. And then uh, I'll summarize it for you uh, afterwards. Prenez place. Vous êtes accompagné par le long cortège des jeunes qui vibre à l'idée de prendre la relève de la France combattante. Vous êtes accompagné par les femmes qui savent à votre exemple qu'aucune porte ne peut plus leur être fermée. Vous êtes suivi par les déshérités qui entrent grâce à vous dans la lumière. Vous êtes auréolé du respect des peuples du monde qui, comme le 11 janvier, partagent avec le nôtre le même amour de la liberté. Pierre Brossolette, Geneviève de Gaulle Antonio, Germaine Tillon, Jean Zé, prenez place. Ici, c'est la vôtre. Vive la République et vive la France. So what the French president just said is he welcomes them into the Pantheon. He says, you are brought here by a long line of youth who are excited to walk in your path. You are brought here by women who now know that they cannot be denied. You are followed by those 
of modest means who come into the light with you. You are the recipients of the respect of all peoples who came together with us on January 11th to show their love for freedom. And in, here he's making a reference to the Charlie Hebdo events. And then he names them, and then he says, I well, you're welcomed again. And then he says, long live the Republic, long live France. Again, uh, that's the standard closing for uh, a French president. So I hope you enjoyed hearing some, some French there. I bet you didn't get to hear any of that on the, on the U.S. or Australian or U.K. media. Well, maybe in the U.K., who knows? All four of those honored this month were part of the French resistance, and so this this is a theme that was important to this president. Now, let me give you a few facts about the Pantheon. How many people are in the Pantheon? Well, 77 with the, with the latest four. The crypt as it stands, and I haven't talked about the crypt yet, but I'm going to get to it. That's really where all the graves, when you enter the building, you're in this big cathedral-like structure, and you have to go down below this this very large crypt that has 77 bodies, but could really have up to 300 without uh, making any modifications. So who decides who goes? Uh, well, it has changed over the years. Right now, it's the French president. Now, the person who put the most, who chose, the person who chose the most people to go into the Pantheon was Napoleon. Uh, the first out of the 77, he uh, decided on about 40 of them, which kind of explains why there are so few women, because it, the, most of them it was done er very early on, and then f a few presidents here and there have added a few, but not that many, really. French President François Mitterrand is the one who insisted on having Pierre et Marie Curie, and also Jean Moulin, who was also uh, of the French resistance and with whom uh, Mitterrand himself had fought. So they knew each other. A more recent president, Nicolas Sarkozy, welcomed into the Pantheon Aimé Césaire, who is a, an author, but only a plaque bears his name in the Pantheon. His family wanted his body to remain in Martinique, the, so a French island, according to his will, so that's what happened. And also, Sarkozy invited Albert Camus, so the author of uh, The Stranger and uh, La Peste, The Peste, I think it's called in English, but his family turned him down. So, you know, another, another author that was uh, put in the Pantheon recently is Alexandre Dumas. Uh, that was in 2002 by Jacques Chirac. A few people were taken out of the Pantheon. For instance, Mirabeau was the very first to be put in the Pantheon. He was a revolutionary, but they removed his body after they realized that there had been some political shenanigans going on, and he had a secret correspondence with the king, and they felt that that made him unworthy. And there were some other people like Marat, Le Pelletier, Dampierre, all, the same thing happened to them. So it's possible that somebody is honored to be buried in the Pantheon and then yanked out. There are also people who are honored, but not there in person, I guess you could say. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince, is the uh, best example I could think of, of course, because his body was never found, so they couldn't put him there. There is so much I could tell you about the Pantheon because the history is never ending and it's very interesting for the most part. But the one thing I haven't talked about that I must talk about right now is the crypt. At the very back of the Pantheon, you'll find the stairs to go down to the crypt. And I'm sure there's some people who go in there and they never find the stairs and they never go down to the crypt. But you should really do that. There, It's huge. You could spend an hour there. But you, I mean, it's very repetitive. It's it's always the same. Once you've seen one of the aisles, you've seen them all pretty much. You're just going to find a lot of names, and that's that's pretty much it. I'll put a few pictures on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 71. So if I was taking friends or family to Paris, would I take them to the Pantheon? 
Well, I'm going to give you a definite answer. Maybe. <laughs> I know I know I would not take children or teens most for the most part unless, you know, it's Halloween and the, the crypt is spectacular, so yeah. But or if you have some sort of tie. I mean, if you have a family member who's, you know, if you're related to one of the famous people, by all means go. But yeah, for kids and teens, I don't really see much of a point unless they have a strong interest in French history and that sort of thing. I would not take persons with mobility issue. Uh, it is not at all accessible to wheelchairs. And uh, for people with uh, minor mobility issues, it, it's not that difficult. There are 38 steps to go down to the crypt. But just to get into the main part, you have 16 uh, steps total. Not a big deal for most people, but that's something uh, that you might want to consider. And the other thing that you have to consider is that the, the Pantheon will read like a storybook if you know the history of France well, but most people don't. It also reads like a, a political history of France because everything inside is there because a political choice was made. And for instance, the painting that adorns the inside of the dome, it's really prime real estate. You can't really miss it. It's beautiful. And it has changed over time. Right now, you'll see a work by an artist called J.R. who he col collated the faces of thousands of people. It's supposed to represent all of humanity. It's black and white. It's very beautiful. I think it's very cool looking and very striking. And it's very modern compared to the rest of the decor inside of the Pantheon. So I really enjoyed that. I'll, I, I, I'll put a picture on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 71. Napoleon I commissioned someone called Antoine Jean Gros to paint the ceiling in 1811. In four years, this painter was told to change the theme four times. At first, it was supposed to be Napoleon. Then Louis XVIII. Then back to Napoleon. Then back to Louis XVIII. It, it mirrors the changes in French political life, which were rapid at, at, in those days. And the building was in flux for many years. Was it going to be a church? Well, Louis XVIII said it's a church. Uh, is it going to be a secular place? Another king, Louis-Philippe, said it's going to be a secular burial place to the glory of patriots. Napoleon, of course, wanted it to be a church, but also a building to the glory of his own patriotism, of course. So you can see it in the architecture and in the decor. Is the decor Greek influences, Christian influences, Masonic influences, of which there are many? Yes, to all of those. Uh, if you spend some time looking around, you'll see some of all of those. And this is really a building that had a hard time deciding what, what it wanted to be when it grew up. When, when Victor Hugo died on May 22, 1885, it was decided right away that he would be buried in the Pantheon. He was given a state funeral and taking the Pantheon on May 31st, 1885. And that kind of marks the date when the Pantheon stopped being in flux. It's, it was decided it's going to be a burial place for the greats of the nation, and it's likely to stay that way now. So thank you, Victor Hugo, for that and many other things as well. The dome of the Pantheon is extraordinary because it's really three domes. You can see the dome uh, from just about anywhere in Paris, the exterior, that I mean, from anywhere in Paris. It's, since it's on a hill, it's easy to spot. But it's to see that it's really three domes, you have to go inside. So when you, when you walk in, you, you go towards the back, and close to where the stairs of the crypt, there's a large-scale model of the dome uh, w where you can really see that it's three in one. There's a, so there's the one that you see from the outside, obviously. There's the one that you see from the inside that has this beautiful black and white painting. And then in the middle, there's something else. It's, it's cool looking. The, the scale model will let you see it very well from up close. Why did they decide to do that? Well, architectural prowess, I guess. But I'm probably simplifying quite a bit. I'm, I'm not sure. It's really cool looking, though. This, uh, this uh, scale model is cool. I'll put a picture again on jonasinfrance.com forward slash 71. Now, I know it used to be that you could climb up the dome and see it from the outside. I'm not sure if it's possible right now because of the renovations. And I didn't think to ask when I was there. And I can't find the information on their website. So I'll, I'll 
I'll call them and uh, put an update on that uh, in the show notes. What I do know is that you can take audio tours. They have self-guided booklets in many languages. You can also reserve a guided tour, but you have to do that 45 days in advance. Now, note to France, that's ridiculous. Asking people to book a tour of a single monument 45 days in advance is silly. That's how things work in France. Important people like to have uh, their schedule booked up a long time in advance and be inaccessible in the moment. You know, that's just, that's just a French thing. I think it's evolving a little bit, but, oh dear, it's, it's still a problem in a lot of places. For instance, I'll just tell you this funny anecdote. I had to renew my French passport. And so I go to the to the city hall where I needed to do it, and I show up with m the paperwork in hand because I had read on the website what you needed. And so I bring all that, and the lady goes, did you make an appointment? No. Oh, because you have to make an appointment, you know. Well, there was nobody <laughs> waiting for her, or she wasn't doing anything. Well, that I could see. I mean, she did, she certainly was not... Uh, dealing with a person at the moment and she says well okay well I guess let's see if my schedule permits that I take you right now and I'm like yeah please take a look at your schedule and and she did take me but you know it's just a thing that that people like so I guess that's all I'm going to tell you about the Pantheon it's it's a cool place it's a bit of an impersonal cold oversized place to me I felt it was a little bit uncomfortable that it was all these men everywhere and white men no less but it's a testament to a lot of history the architecture is cool would i say you must see the pantheon you're only in paris for a week and eh, no if you're only in paris for a week there's so many things to do i it wouldn't be on my you know first week in paris list but if you've been to paris a few times if you are interested in the history of france then yeah it's it's a cool place and it's it's beautiful in its own too grandiose way <laughs> i guess is how i would put it and the crypt is is nice i mean it's very large uh you have a few different uh, halls and they all kind of look the same go go look at at, at a picture on jonasinfrance.com forward slash 71 it'll give you an idea of the sort of place it is now let's move on to the listener question. A listener named Sue uh, sent this in and uh, I'll just let her ask the question. Here she goes. Bonjour, Annie. My husband and I will be traveling to Paris in July and this will be our first trip to Europe. I don't speak French and I'm a little concerned about arriving at Charles de Gaulle Airport and making it from there via train to our hotel in the left bank. If you have any advice on how to find the trains in the airport and to select the right train, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Sue. Okay, the first thing you need to know is that the train that links the CDG airport to Paris is the RERB. That's the name of the train. I'll put a picture of the RERB logo and a link also to the PDF that shows you every stop on that line on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 71. That part is easy enough. But to get to the RERB, depending on where exactly you land, you may need to take either a free shuttle bus or a free metro called the CDG VAL, C-D-G-V-A-L, which will take you to the RERB. So if I were you, since you don't speak French and will be probably be tired and cranky by the time you get to Paris, to make your life easier, I would find out what terminal your airline flies into at CDG. Your airline website probably has that information because it's not the sort of thing that changes very often at all. So find out before you arrive. And once you know that terminal, which terminal you'll be arriving at, you can go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash 71 and print out the instructions that are relevant to your situation. The Paris airport puts, they put an information page together and I'll 
take you to that link. It's got photos. It's in English. It'll tell you everything you need to know. So once you're on uh, the Join Us in France website, you'll have a choice, Terminal 1, Terminal 2, and it'll take you to the, to the page in English that explains it all. And it's pretty well done. Now, before you get on the RERB, you'll need to purchase a ticket. There are automatic ticket machines, but they only take credit cards with a chip and a four-digit PIN. And if you don't have one of those, you can either pay with Euro coins or go to a teller. Uh, there are tellers most of the time there, so don't panic. You'll find someone. As I explained in episode 67, which was called 10 Tips to Get Around Paris... CDG, the airport, is in zone 5, which is the outermost zone of the Paris metro and RER system. So the weekly card for that is going to be expensive because it's the one that takes you the furthest out. For most people, it's best to get a single ticket to get into Paris. It'll cost you €9.75 one way. And then once you exit the RER in the center of Paris, wherever f your first stop is... The metro station is always linked to the RER via tunnels. Sometimes they're short, sometimes they're, they're, they're long. That really depends on exactly where you are. You follow the signs for the metro, and then at the metro you get your Navigo card, which is the, the Paris transportation card, from a teller at the first chance you get. Now, you, you don't have to get a Navigo card. You could get just a 10-trip kind of card if you're not going to take the metro very much. Or you could buy a single ticket. It just depends on, you know, how much you're going to be using the metro. And you only buy however many zones you need for your visits. Most people use need one zones 1 and 2. But, of course, it, it depends on where you want to go. The RER trains, they run more or less every 10 minutes, and it'll take you about 35 minutes to go between the airport and the center of Paris on average. You told me you'll be staying at, on Rue Jacob, so you'll need to exit the RER at the stop called Denfer Rochereau, D-E-N-F-E-R-T dash Rochereau. And, uh, and then from there you'll find Metro line 4 in the direction of Porte de Clignancourt. Porte, the first word is P-O-R-T-E, space D-E, and then Clignancourt. And then you exit six stops later at Saint-Germain-des-Prés, which is a beautiful place. Then, then you'll just have a 300-minute walk to your hotel. It could, you know, I mean, 300 meters, it could take you three minutes or 30 minutes, depending on how much luggage you have. So that, that also um, depends on a few things, but it's close. So if you if you took a taxi to do the same trip, it would cost you 90 euros more or less. I went to a site that estimates that sort of thing, but it's not very precise. Uber is also in France. Uber Pop is in France. I know for sure. I'm not sure if the regular Uber is also in France. It, it will be more affordable than a taxi, but I haven't used them, so it, I can't really tell you very much about this. So if you have a question too, go to www.speakpipe.com forward slash join us in France. Or if you go to the joinusinfrance.com website, on the right-hand side, you'll find a tab that says send voicemail. And I'll answer it on the show. Now for the French tip of the week. Let's stay with the public transportation theme and learn how to ask where the metro or RER is. You'll be surprised how small the signs are for the metro in Paris. Sometimes it takes a bit of looking around just to find where the entrance to the metro station is. So you might want to ask someone. There are many ways to ask the same question, but I tried to find the sounds and the way to formulate the question that would be the easiest to say for an English native. So here you go. Look him in the eye and say, Bonjour, monsieur. Je cherche le métro. Pouvez-vous m'aider? Or, if it's a woman, Bonjour, madame, je cherche le métro. Pouvez-vous m'aider? Or, if it's a young lady, you might say, Bonjour, mademoiselle, je cherche le métro. Pouvez-vous m'aider? Now, if you're looking for the RER, you, can, you might say, Bonjour, and then either Monsieur, madame, or mademoiselle. Pick your poison. 
Donc, bonjour mademoiselle, je cherche le RER. Pouvez-vous m'aider If you're looking for a bus stop, you could say, bonjour mademoiselle, je cherche un arrêt de bus. Pouvez-vous m'aider Un arrêt de bus. Arrêt de bus. It's bus stop. So hopefully, they'll point in the right direction. You look happy. You say merci, au revoir, and there you have it. So let's uh, repeat just one more time. Bonjour, monsieur. Je cherche. And then whatever it is that you're looking for. Le métro, uh, le RER, uh, la boulangerie. If you're looking for a bakery, je cherche... Uh, Whatever it is, you can insert whatever word. Donc, bonjour, monsieur, je cherche, bla, bla, bla. Pouvez-vous m'aider? Can you help me? There you go. That's your French tip of the week. Now, to conclude the show today, I'll play you the Chant des Partisans, which is a song that was sung at the Pantheon just a few weeks ago, a few days ago, when they uh, welcomed four new people into the Pantheon that were all with the French resistance. This particular song is very emblematic. French people all know it. Um, they might know all the lyrics, but they've heard the, the tune anyway. It was written by two French people of Russian descent, music by Anna Marley and lyrics by Joseph Kessel, and they both fought in the French resistance. I hope you enjoyed that short snippet. The stepping you heard was a military guard doing their parade in front of the Pantheon at the same time. The choir and orchestra were doing their thing. I liked it very much, which is really not surprising because I'm a sucker for choirs and orchestras. But I think that one was particularly good. Thank you, Arinda Dolter, for your donation. Makes me feel appreciated, and I love that. Thank you. And you know what else makes me feel appreciated? Loyal fans who subscribe to the mailing list. To do that, go to joinusinfrance.com and look for the green button on the left. I'm not a spammer. I don't even have anything to sell at this time. But when I do finish my book, I'll make sure loyal fans will always get the best deal from me on those e-guides. And that's how I'll let you know. So thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next week. Au revoir. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Join Us in France Travel Podcast. For more on this topic and many others, check out our Facebook page. I put a lot of information there that never makes it into the episodes. And hmm, how, how do I say this without sounding too French and too blunt? Okay, I'll just say it. On Facebook, you need to be social. If you don't click like and if you don't comment... Facebook will assume that you're not that into it and they will stop displaying stuff from the Join Us in France Travel podcast to you. Really? You? You're not that much into preparing your trip to France? I, I really don't believe that. You guys are Francophiles. So just, just, just click like and say things. And then you'll be good. All right. Happy vacation planning and don't be a stranger. Au revoir. <laughs>